Um, thank you everyone for joining us for the third in our um, seminar series in our agricultural, sorry, I'm trying to show. Okay, um, the third in our seminar series um, in the Agricultural and Human Sciences Department with my friend and colleague, Dr. Jamie Alexander, who has um, been with us a short time, but has already done so much in the department. She is an assistant professor and extension specialist, and um, we're very excited to hear about her work. In addition to all of the things that she's done and will tell us about, she's also an alum of our master's yeah. program. So it's really exciting to have you here. Thank you, Jamie, for being with us. And um, we will have time for questions at the end, and I'm happy to navigate the, ch the chat for you. Okay. Just and I have 30 minutes, right? So 12.30, I'll try to be done. Um, so you all know my name, Jamie Alexander, and all that introduction has already been done, but I have to bring your attention to this picture, right? So if you see this beautiful picture of this little girl, it's not my daughter, although my daughter looks very much like I did as a four or five-year-old. She's only three now. Um, and I'm resting on my dad's knee here. What I like, and what I'm talking a little bit about focus today is when you look at the picture, it kind of looks like I'm focusing right, on what future moves I'm gonna make next. I do have a twin sister and a younger brother who were also in the original picture. My twin sister looked cuter than I did, so I chopped her out, and now it just has a picture of myself here. All right, so some background information about myself. Uh, my PhD I earned it from Oklahoma State University in Human Sciences. Obviously, my master's from NC State. Uh, in Human Development Family Studies, and then my bachelor's in Human Development Family Studies at UNCG. And the reason why I'm sharing this information is I think it's helpful to understand where we come from and our training so that you can understand a little bit about how we might perceive the research problems that we're investigating and the work that we're doing. Um, another thing that I think is important is uh, I was born in the Philippines. So in San Fernando, my mom is Filipino, and for the most part, I was raised in Durham, North Carolina. So there's like a seven year gap between being born in the Philippines. I lived there for a little while uh, up until about one years old. And then uh, my dad was in the military. So we you know, lived all over, but Durham is where I call home, right? So shout out to Durham Public Schools, which has influenced my research up to this point. Um, and then I also wanted to share that because when I talk about blackness and about black populations as I'm studying it and I'm researching it and then developing a program now around that, it really was informed by not just my own personal experiences. And so when I first got into literature on black families, I took that as an opportunity to learn a little bit more about that from a different perspective. Um, obviously being in a bicultural home, there are different challenges, but it's something I'm really proud about, but I also recognize that that, um, that influenced the way that I looked at particular issues, especially those surrounding race and ethnicity. The other thing I think you should know is that up to this point, I've been an assistant professor. And um, as uh, Dr. Hardison, Moody mentioned, I am an extension specialist now, but I was not before. And so in terms of the work that I did, it was primarily teaching. Uh, and that was in uh, University of New York, University of South Carolina, and obviously I'm here now. So in terms of my research emphases, you've got a chart here. But before I look at that or talk about that, I want you just to take a look at this picture. <laughs> this is a picture that I did not have on my phone. I texted my husband yesterday when I was trying to prep these slides and I said, do you have that picture? from when I first collected data for my dissertation. And it was a snowy day, so this is Oklahoma State University. And as you can see, I was very excited. I don't know if I was more excited that it was snowing or that I was collecting data, but for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna say that I was excited because I was collecting data. And so as I'm talking about my own research, I thought it was fitting to show this picture. Um, and like a good husband, he had the picture saved on his phone <laughs> and I didn't have it. But research emphases include the intersections of parenting, career development, purpose, adolescence, and working adulthood. Whenever I say that, it's a mouthful. Um, and that's really because it is in the sense that we're talking about different fields. So if you know anything about human development and family science or studies, uh, YFCS, for example, is, um, would be fitting there. We are an interdisciplinary field. And so we draw from multiple disciplines in understanding um, the human experience and how to optimize outcomes. Uh, and that's no different in my case. I'm drawing from um, the parenting literature, career development, which is just a whole other thing. Uh, the purpose literature, which I'm really excited about. And then just understanding adolescence and emerging adulthood. Primarily, though, I am interested in uh, these things as it pertains to African-American and Black outcomes or youth outcomes. 
So here's what we know, right? So I'm gonna talk about these th or four uh, distinct kind of fields, if you will. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about my work and then kind of how that's nestled in with other research. But in terms of parenting, we know that parenting behaviors influence a host of adolescent and emerging adult outcomes. And so by adolescent, we're talking about teenagers, right? But emerging adults include individuals between the ages of 18 and about upwards of 29. What's fascinating is that the brain doesn't stop developing up until your mid to late 20s. And so we talk about decisions in the face of risk, for example, adolescents typically don't do that well and neither do college students. And I say that with a chuckle because I remember teaching undergrads and every time I would teach adolescent development and we would cover the brain, many of them would say, I'm not an adolescent. But then they would also say, well, I'm not technically a full on adult, right? And so um, that's kind of the stage of development that I look at. In terms of parenting behaviors that I focus on, I look at parenting behaviors as they relate to achievement and career development. Those are the main types of things. There's a ton of things that people study uh, as it pertains to parenting, and it might be with emotion uh, regulation or control. Those are not my areas, but they are still very important. Um, parents are perhaps the most influential persons in a child's life. And when I say child, I'm not talking about childhood. I just mean like teenagers and emerging adults. And this, you know, when you think about this, think about their interaction with other people, how they access resources, how they navigate the world. Um, their expectations, how they nurture people, their perceptions, values, and beliefs. These are just examples, but all of these things shape the immediate environment of the developing individual. So that's really important to take into consideration. Uh, anytime that we're looking at the role that parents play, communities play, knowing that adolescents are not developing in vacuums. Right? It's easy, I think, for us to say, we wanna focus on adolescent outcomes, but not to always pay attention to the context in which those outcomes are actually developing or happening. There are four main typologies uh, related to parenting style, and they are authoritative, uh, authoritarian, permissive, indulgent, and permissive, permissive, neglectful. In terms of authoritative parenting, there's an asterisk there because that is a parenting style that we want to see. And so a lot of my work focuses on uh, examining the extent, for example, uh, to which parents are using an authoritative approach uh, in their parenting. And this includes even with teens. Um, if you are in the education sector, you'll find that research supports an authoritative teaching style as well. And so authoritative just means that the individual uh, has high levels of warmth and responsiveness that are coupled with high levels of demandingness or expectations. So it's not the parent who just says, you do what I say because I said it, right, and sit down. That would be an authoritarian person um, who has high uh, demandingness or high levels of expectations but no warmth. They're coupling that with the responsiveness to the needs of the individual. Obviously, with the teenager, they're going to need time to be autonomous, right? And so parents should be aware of that when they think about their needs and still have expectations that are um, relative to, to their developmental stage, that's a good thing. Permissive indulgent, those are parents who are raising brats. So you don't have expectations that, are, um, that structure the, the development or the behavior of the child, but then you also don't really have um, or you do actually have, you have a lot of uh, nurturance. So you're, you're, you're um, maybe bribing the child a lot to do what you want them to do. Um, the permissive neglectful parent though is just uninvolved altogether. And so negative outcomes tend to be associated with the authoritarian, the permissive indulgent and permissive ne neglectful styles. But one thing I do wanna take note of, or have you take note of, is that authoritarian parenting styles tend to be common in black families. Yet, research shows overwhelmingly that the style that tends to be most beneficial is authoritative. And so I think it's a delicate dance. And, you know, I'm going to talk about the program that I'm developing now, but even coming up with the content and doing some focus groups, um, talking to Black parents and asking them, what's your perce perception on this? How did you feel when you, you know, saw this information? I'm aware of the fact that culture plays a big role in how we understand each other, how we structure our daily lives. And so, you know, if we come across in a way that says, you don't know what you're doing, but I do, this is what you should do that may not yield the outcomes that we want, at least in the programmatic effort. And so uh, black families, again, tend to be uh, authoritarian in their parenting style. And although most research supports authoritative, and I'm saying most, but overwhelmingly it does, there is some research that shows that authoritarian parenting style is not as negative with black families as it might be with white families. Um, and that, again, is interesting. I think you have to consider the cultural context for that. Uh, there are a few snapshots here, if you will, of some uh, studies that uh, I did, and all of these 
focus on parenting styles, you'll see that there's a mix with career development, um, some with future orientation. And I'll talk a little bit about a little bit about all of these. Uh, they're just on this parenting slide, though. So just know that when I talk about these, there are intersections with the other things I'm going to talk about in a second. So in terms of parenting styles, effects on college students, career decision-making, self-efficacy. Career decision-making, self-efficacy refers to an individual's confidence and their ability to perform career-related tasks uh, that are uh, really about making decisions. You know, is this the college I should attend? How do I choose a major um, or what have you? Now, the parenting styles which I just mentioned, I looked at all, all of those. Permissive parenting was collapsed, though. So we didn't distinguish between neglectful and indulgent. Typically, when you look at the research in this area, they do the same thing. Um, and the outcomes are typically negative. What was interesting is we didn't find a negative association. We didn't find an association at all uh, between permissive parenting and career decision uh, making self-efficacy. But we did find a positive significant relationship between both authoritative and authoritarian parenting styles and their confidence and their abilities to make career decisions. Um, talking about that and discussing that, one of the things that you could take note of, which we did, is that uh, two of the universities in which we recruited participants from attended a private uh, religious university. And so there are some um, indications if you think about culture within particular religions that might suggest an authoritarian approach is used. Uh, and so that's one thing that could make a difference. But again, even when we're making recommendations on what you should do in practice, uh, we're not necessarily taking that specific funding and saying everyone should use both. We're still saying this is surprising to us given what we know, but really what we're gonna encourage people to do is to focus on authoritative pra uh, parenting practices. And so uh, looking at the maternal closeness paper, uh, maternal closeness is interesting in the sense that while it does play a role in adolescence future uh, orientation, and this particular study was with an all black sample uh, in the rural uh, South. And so uh, maternal closeness plays a significant role in future orientation. So that like really refers to how much you're looking forward to the future, which relates to aspirations and expectations, which are good. Those are good things. Uh, and we looked at that with future education uh, orientation and future career orientation. Um, but what was interesting is that ethnic identity mediated the relationship. So it explains relationship between um, maternal closeness and uh, future orientation. And so looking at careers, the roles that families play, parents, for example, you want to look at parenting style because it does play a role. Sometimes the perception is that once kids are out the house, parents don't have an effect anymore, but that's not true. And if you think back to your own upbringing and just think back like right now, there are some things that you struggle with today that you know <laughs> related to something mom or dad did, whether it was one time or constantly. And so just thinking about the impact that parents play in the lives of youth is really, really important. Uh, this last article, I'm highlighting this, that is not specific to black youth. Um, in fact, that focused mainly on like, uh, Latino or Latinx youth. Uh, the reason I wanna highlight this is because look, I looked at real non-involvement. And so there's a lot of research that shows that when parents are not involved in their kids' educational experiences, they tend to have poor outcomes. But then how do you explain how or why some youth do very, very well despite that? And so what was interesting is that we actually accounted for reasons why youth perceived that their parents were not involved in their schooling. So for example, my parents didn't, you know, don't attend school functions because they don't, they don't have transportation um, or they just don't care. What we found was that having a parent, having a child or a teen say, my parent is not involved because of work schedule difficulties actually was associated with higher GPA. So GPA was the outcome that we were interested in looking at. So again, just looking at perception. So not just involvement, but how does the child perceive that? How does the teen perceive that? Uh, all of those things are important. All right, moving on to career development. Again, I'm talking about these intersections. So hang on, we're, you're on a ride, but we're gonna make it through. Uh, career development, I know that it's contextually influenced. Again, parents play a big role in this, and um, they can play a role in this by the way in which they encourage you to explore careers and the way in which um, they navigate resources for those teens. Who are your parents' friends? What kind of jobs did they have? What types of interactions did your parents promote? Um, my mom was a banker, and she could give me lots of banking connections, but I didn't want to be a banker. So she was limited in many ways because of something like that. Um, another thing that's important to think about with career development is the process. And so 
a good process, and I'm using good kind of broadly here, what involves someone taking great leaps to explore lots of options before committing to something. When you have individuals who commit to something uh, before exploring, we call that foreclosure. And so when I look at my research, uh, particularly with my dissertation, I was very much interested. And this is kind of what spurred on uh, the research agenda that I, that I have now. Um, lots of black male college athletes, and there's a whole literature on that also, are likely to foreclose on careers in pursuit of a professional career path uh, in sports. The NCAA has it on their website that you have less than a 2% chance of making it in the league, yet there are many who still say, this is my way out. And so what we find in the literature is that for black youth, going you know, to the NFL or to the NBA, that's a, you know, a path they're taking, is something that's gonna help them and their entire community. So going back to this idea of blackness and families and parenting, uh, racial ethnic socialization, which I'll talk about in a little bit, was really interesting to me. And so one aspect about black families or communities that's really important is family loyalty. And so this idea that if I make it out, you make it out. And I'll give you an example. I did a focus group with a group of black parents and I was just so thankful that they were able to meet with me. It was via Zoom, it was when the pandemic kind of first happened. And one of the guys, he was a pastor of a church, um, he looked at the camera because it was via Zoom and he said, honey, no, no, no. When you make it, we all make it. So he's really saying, don't you thank me? You know, we're thanking you because all of us are going to be able to have better outcomes when we support each other. So this idea of going to the professional sport um, league like the NBA or the, or the NFL isn't necessarily a selfish one, although it is pushed onto a lot of black males. Uh, and we see this from very small ages. So you think about peewee football, for example, and the ways in which schools will allow for black teams, specifically uh, athletes, to kind of get by without having to do all the requirements. But then there are also tons of things embedded in, in uh, systemic racism, which you probably are thinking about, right? Uh, I don't necessarily look at all of those specific things, but we do take that into account when we're looking at how do black youth end up with the perceptions that they have about what is viable for a career, right? Some of that is related to career preparedness, academic achievement. And so if your achievement is low, it's gonna be really hard for a team to see themselves uh, being able to occupy a particular position. Um, and that's what I found. I did find that uh, black men athletes are more likely to foreclose. That's similar to what others have found uh, as it pertains to racial, ethnic socialization. I looked at this across four different groups, black male athletes, black male non-athletes, <laughs> black female athletes, black female non-athletes. I was really wanting to know whether there was a gender um, and athlete status kind of interaction effect. And it appears that there was, uh, and my dissertation is not published, so I'm just talking about kind of what spurred all my research here. Uh, we found that, or I found, that lots of the racial ethnic messages that parents were communicating actually did differ by gender and athlete status. So they looked very different for black female athletes and different for black male athletes, okay? Um, black youth in general are less likely to see some careers or occupations as truly viable or uh, desirable due to lack of racial ethnic representation in those fields. There's a study by Big Larry Cogley, uh, which is really fascinating to me. Uh, and what they found is that when they presented to children uh, occupations that were primarily represented by white people, they perceived those as much more desirable and valuable. So the hierarchy was, was higher, or the rank on the hierarchy was higher for those individuals or those occupations. The, the opposite was true in the sense that they found occupations mainly occupied by Blacks as being less desirable and less valuable. And so even Black youth are putting a different value on something. So it's not just that we don't have a good number of Blacks that are represented in a wide variety of occupations. Sometimes there's another effect that's happening where they're looking at that as being negative because we see more Blacks. Um, in some ways that could be tied to something like a negative racial narrative or identity. Um, so I'm gonna pause there because I don't wanna to jump too far ahead, but uh, just finishing up the slide here, it is a process that doesn't necessarily occur linearly. So we think about you know, career development, you explore, then you commit and you stay, and that's not true. People you know, explore, they commit, they explore again, sometimes they foreclose in the process of attempting to explore later on in life. Uh, that's very much the case today because lots of people change careers. I can't remember what the statistic is, but it's more than four times that people will change careers in their lifetime. And this is my third academic position, so that's a good example also. Uh, 
um, career development, uh, looking at careers and how that happens, choose an occupation, you're able to land that uh, because it, the, the long lasting uh, effects of work are very real as it pertains to overall well being and psychological health, um, satisfaction. You know, so we're looking at spending a third of your life on working. You want to choose wisely. You want to choose something that fits where you are and what your gifts and talents are. The other thing I want to highlight here is that career development should start early. Many high schoolers don't feel prepared for college or careers until so there's a, like a, a news article on that. And I thought that was really interesting. It's something that we see and we perceive, but we don't always have a lot of empirical data on it. Right? But youth are actually saying, we're getting ready to graduate from high school. I don't even know how to apply for a college application. I don't know what the next step is. Uh, and so while anecdotal information is important, and I, my husband used to be a school teacher, he's no longer a school teacher, he's an assistant principal now, but um, a lot of the examples that he would provide for me are very much similar to what I just stated here. That you'd have high school seniors in their second semester say, every semester, you know, with a different set of students. Uh, yes, I really wanna go, I really wanna go to, to college coach. And he's like, well, what, what do you have prepared? Have you submitted something? No. And so if, you, if your gap year isn't intentional, that's a problem. And so most people don't recover in the sense that they go to school after taking gap year if that gap year wasn't actually intended to be a gap year. All right, so going on to adolescence and emerging adulthood, we know that adolescent outcomes are a predictor of later life outcomes. So understanding um, how to promote academic achievement, for example, is really important. Uh, I talked a little bit about why I focus on families, and that's because families and parents play a big role in that process and their expectations that they set and um, or communicate and the ways in which they interact or advocate for their kids at school, right? Sometimes it's not at the school building, it's on the phone with the teacher or it's a conversation with the student or their child about what they should do and how to navigate a particular environment. Um, identity is a, is a marker, identity development is a marker of adolescence. And this continues well in summer and adulthood, uh, just because you have more time to explore. There are people who would argue against the idea of emerging adulthood, um, given the fact that we are in the US and that college is now perceived as a normative kind of next step after high school. I would agree with this type of conceptualization of this stage of life. And so the things that I focus on tend to be race and ethnicity as development or identity development and then career identity. Now there are a variety of domains uh, but in terms of race, understanding why race matters, right? We know it does, but why does it matter? What does real, real race have to do with the things that you see as being okay for you? Um, I came across some studies not too long ago that looked at negative na uh, racial narratives uh, in Black boys, and it was really disheartening to me because you, you have people who are adopting a narrative that isn't their own. It's one that is just communicated to them. And so looking at how race is construed, going back to parents, how do parents communicate messages and what messages do they communicate? For example, do they communicate messages as it pertains to black racial ethnic identity about racial pride or racial heritage or um, cultural or racial history, like slavery, for example, right? Are they encouraging you to go to museums that focus on blackness? Do they celebrate different aspects of black culture? Um, and despite common perceptions, adolescents still enjoy spending time with their parents and look to them for advice. And so I put that in there really because I, I think it's important for bridging all of this together. Sometimes the idea or perception is that they're not interested in their parents and parents don't know what to do, but parents want to know what to do. They oftentimes don't know how to communicate some of the things that they want to communicate. And so in the programmatic efforts that um, I have developed and I'm getting ready to pilot <laughs> pretty soon, uh, it's one of the things you wanted to include is a parent component. So making sure that we engage parents with information. Now, in terms of purpose, oh man, I'm running out of time. Uh, here's what we know. So purpose answers the question, why am I here? And Damon and colleagues define it as a stable and generalized intention to accomplish something that is at once meaningful to the self and a consequence to the world beyond the self. That basically means it's meaningful to you, yes, but it benefits people outside of you. So I can't just say I want to make money and be rich. That's not a purpose, <laughs> not according to Damon and colleagues. But Anthony Burroughs says a sense of purpose is, is integral to the human experience and that purpose is a forward looking directionality and intention to do something in the world. It's different than a goal which can be accomplished, which I thought was a really good definition of purpose. And so the purpose literature shows tons of benefits 
to youth having a sense of purpose. And it used to be thought that youth couldn't develop purpose, that it was something that adults had later in life, but that's not true. Purpose actually develops concurrently with identity. And so they, the two can inform each other. And so what I've been interested in looking at is how purpose is developing, um, the role that purpose plays in uh, preparing for college, for example, that kind of thing. But just uh, note that empirical research highlights purpose as an internal asset that protects youth against the negative effects of adverse experiences, and it propels youth forward uh, towards meaningful engagement with others. So adolescents who had a sense of purpose uh, were more likely to use positive reframing coping with adverse experiences, which is really good. You're talking about Black youth who are more likely to experience discrimination, especially those that are attending schools that are, for example, Title I, right, or schools that are concentrated or in areas with concentrated disadvantage, economic disadvantage. Um, what I thought was really cool is that these youth didn't just have these sense of purposes that we know to not just benefit the self, but they actually engaged uh, with their purpose-related pursuits in ways that centered their own role in improving the adverse experience of others. So they were also interested in helping other people come out of those bad experiences. So um, another study found that having a strong sense of purpose in life moderates the relationship between perceived racial discrimination and suicidal ideation. Um, and it did so above and beyond ethnic identity, which was not significant in this study. But across many studies, ethnic identity is a protective factor. So it's not to say that we should not look at ethnic identity, but perhaps we should be focusing on how we perceive race as it pertains to Black youth, um, and then how race might be positioned within one's purpose. So that's what I look at and what I'm interested in looking at. Um, I did present recently at the European Association uh, for Research on Adolescence Conference uh, not too long ago. And so I shared this here because I did look at the role of purpose and occupational engagement for decision-making self-efficacy and college application pre preparation. And so you might be thinking, well, what did you find? I think you know the answer. The purpose was a significant positive predictor of all of those things. So youth were much more prepared to submit application, uh, college applications, and they had higher levels of for decision-making self-efficacy, which matters, because if you don't have confidence in your ability to do something, you're not going to engage in that in the same way that you would if you did have confidence. Uh, and they were also more likely to engage in occupational-related activities, right? So these things matter in terms of being able to choose a good fitting career uh, or occupation. I'm going to skip this, if that's okay, because I know we have not a lot of time left, but you can see it. If you want slides, you can have a copy of them. But I did want to just highlight research methods because I know that's what we're supposed to talk about. So our research and what we, uh, the methods that we employ. Up to this point, meaning before coming to NC State as an assistant professor, I mainly relied and, and did basic research. And basic research is really good, but basic research needs to happen in a way that's translated for applied research. And so this article by Morris and colleagues Really fascinating. It takes 17 years. That's too long. That's too long from a basic research study. All of the things that we're learning about life in, in my area, in particular, Black youth, their parents, for development purpose, that's too long, right, of a gap. There are communities who are trying to find ways to solve those issues, but they don't have the resources that we have. And so one of the things that I'm very excited about in my current role is being able to leverage some of those things, whether it be expertise or knowledge, and helping um, communities. The group that's actually working with us to pilot our program, I'm saying our because I see it as a collective effort, even though it was an idea that stemmed way, way long ago. Um, and I think that's something that Blacks would say also, it's ours, right? It's not just mine. Um, but one of the, the group that's helping us with the pilot is already doing some of this stuff, which is quite interesting. Not the same things that we're doing, but what I mean by that is they have taken a step to do what they think needs to be done, but without all of the tape that we might have on our end. Uh, so now I'm doing applied research. Where you see the optics image, this little circle right here, I put this here because I wanted to highlight that the reason why I am now doing applied work is because of this programmatic effort. So my role as an extension specialist, which is really exciting to me. Um, and the same is true for you know, cross-sectional versus longitudinal. A lot of the research that I've done in the past, all of it really has been survey. Uh, research or using survey methods and has been cross-sectional because I want to be able to document and examine the impact of optics on the outcomes that I'm interested in. I need to look at this over time, right? It's not a one and done type of thing. You want to see how impactful is it? Um, and then that also helps 
not just for like the sake of publishing research, but if we're impacting lives, do we need to make modifications? Do we need to offer a refresher course? That type of thing. Um, and so now I'm, I am doing longitudinal research in the sense that once we pilot, we know that <laughs> that's gonna continue. And the same is true for focus groups. I've done that before, but for, uh, for sure, a lot of the work that I've done with focus groups now is because of optics. So some of that is programmatic, being able to meet with parents and saying, what is it that you need? This is what I know we need based on the literature, but I wanna know what you feel like. Because those felt needs are important too. Uh, interviews, you know, in my PhD program, I was heavily quantitatively trained and I have an appreciation for quantitative research, but I also understand that qualitative research is just as important. It helps us to have a picture of the story behind the numbers. Um, and sometimes it allows for us to get to the numbers, right? We need to know what the preliminary data show. Um, if we're gonna come up with a theory and think about grounded theory, all those things matter. So I'm loving that I'm getting to get my feet wet and interviewing. Um, and then mobile diaries is really exciting to me. And so with the evaluation component, we are actually gonna have uh, youth, a certain number, because it costs money, but a certain number of youth complete mobile diaries for four weeks dur during the program. And so every day they're gonna post that diary, uh, anything in, that incites a sense of purpose. So it's like Instagram, except for it's a, it's a research kind of tool. So the only the researchers have access to the data, but they're familiar with using social media. Right, so if I see someone who's you know laid out on the ground on a stretcher, there's an ambulance nearby, and somehow that makes me feel like, oh man, I want to help people in this way. I want to help people medically, right? They might take a picture of that, describe their thoughts about that. And so I'm also really excited about just getting a different form of qualitative data that I typically would not have thought about before. So there's tons of you know studies on mobile, on diaries, but the mobile diary is really cool to me. So this is the end, yes, of my talk. And I will turn it over to Dr. Donaldson, or are we taking questions? Yeah. Am I taking questions? Yeah. Um, so if folks online, you're welcome to send a question in the chat and I can monitor those for you. Um, all right, let me see. I have a question to get us started. So um, I'm really interested in what you're what you're hearing in some of the formative research with the um, with parents and and how that because you, what you're saying is you want to hear what the parents you you know what the literature says but you want to hear what the parents have said and have those things coalesced or are you hearing different things? Yeah, I would say mm, yes, they have coalesced. The one thing that I was surprised to hear but not surprised to hear. I wasn't surprised to hear it just maybe as a person, um, but it's not something I see in the literature all the time. Parents want to see financial literacy in a program. And so when they think about their kids' careers, so I mean, a lot of parents in the group said, we don't care what they do. We want them to be successful, but we realize that where we are, right, we're, and no one said that where they failed, but the impression that I got was perhaps where they wish that they could have provided more for their kid. Um, or maybe themselves as information on finances, so being literate um, in that that field. So I would say that's the only thing for me that was like new. And so it is something that we have included as a resource to families with, within the program. They can find resources on our website, for example, and we do hint at it. Um, I don't know if we're going to end up covering that. I know that there's one particular grant that I looked at for funding the program, and they are interested in financial literacy. So that's a case we would obviously build that into a direct session. Um, but I thought that was really interesting. And so many of them were like, we know they can get different jobs. We don't know how to help them do that necessarily. But if they don't know how to use the money they're making at whatever job they've got, then they're not going to do well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just got to my dirt. But that seems like a really cool connection with what Dr. Donaldson and Dr. Bird are doing college students, right, in the financial literacy arena. Um, it's very, I don't know, I just saw this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, um, okay, so um, like Carol and then Dr. Bird just said, hooray parents, so yeah. Um, so uh, Katie Poy and uh, Ben Chapman have both have questions about the mobile diary. So um, Kate just wants to kind of hear more about the platform and how you're using it. And then Dr. Chapman says, or Dr. Poy, I'm sorry, 
said, and then Dr. Chapman says, um, I'm really interested in the methodology related to diaries and what are some of the challenges that you've encountered with that data collection approach. So overview and then challenges of the diary approach. Okay, so I'll give overview first. Uh, I'm using the Indemo platform, I-N-D-E-E-M-O. And there are a variety of things that you can do. So you get to choose what features your mobile diary has for your participants. So ones that I have chosen allow for um, like a sliding scale. So for example, one question is, well, I already told you one question um, or prompt, you know, anytime you think about your sense of purpose, you want to take a picture, but you have an, uh, an option to prompt them to respond if they have not responded all day. But then there's also a sliding scale. So one question we, we have is, you know, where, where are you on this sliding scale in terms of how you're feeling about purpose uh, or being able to find a career that allows for you to fill that out, fill, you know, your sense of purpose out. And it's, you know, like a smiley face going all the way down like a spectrum, if you will, or scale to a sad face. And so that's another way that we can get some unique data um, and how they're feeling by kind of an emotion or I would say it's emoji. But uh, in terms of issues with data collection, I can't yet report to you, but I'm happy to share them. Once we start, we start uh, November 1st is the first uh, session that we're gonna have. And we're doing or completing our trainings for facilitators on Friday. The mobile diary data collection starts in session two. The session one is really like the welcome where we also collect baseline data like survey uh, from the participants. So from session two all the way through session five, those participants for the mobile diary will be entering information in them. Um, the one thing I like is that we get to prompt them. You know, I, I get to manage and say, you didn't post. I mean, I don't say that, but there's an option to, to nudge them, so to speak. Yeah, it's really nice. Uh, it's really very interesting. Got a lot of, it looks like it has a lot of um, capabilities to lots of different kinds of things. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about pricing. I didn't feel like it was too expensive to use, which is why I was really excited to use it. And it, it has a platform of a social media page or account. So like Instagram, it looks everyone like, knows yeah. how to do it, yeah. It's very familiar. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a community yeah. marketing at all. And I thought about attrition. These are teams. You know, if you have them writing in an actual diary, or something else they might not want to, but because it looks like social media, my thought is that that might be enough to engage them every day in it, you know, and kids like to be creative with social media. That in itself is an interesting research question. They use it. Yes. <laughs> you know. Dr. Alexander, thank you for your statement. I think it's very challenging. For example, if a student is convinced that they're going to change majors to animal science and they're going to go to vet school, and you try to counsel them and explain a C in genetics and a C in biology are insurmountable for going to vet school. Mm -hmm. It is even more challenging when that student is racial or ethnic minority or otherwise underserved because you want to believe in them and you want to help them. Mm -hmm. Do you have some thoughts about the role of academic advising and how we can understand parenting and purpose and connect to purpose to potentially help the student? Yeah, that's a really great question and it's a complex question. I will say that's actually what we're trying to do with the program. Uh, not academic advising, but you know, we're talking to teens about their gifts and their talents. Purpose is one thing, but also being able to recognize what it is that you do well, um, naturally, so to speak, is important for them to be able to see, for their parents to see. Sometimes you have you know, parents saying, this is what you're going to do. And so the parents are the ones who are pushing that particular option. And in terms of race, and I have seen this, and I just talked to a colleague today about this, um, I, I have seen in my own personal um, like friend groups and have heard from other people how challenging it can be because in some ways there might be a really high pursuit of a major or a degree because of the perceived value of that thing. My example, I don't know that I don't know that it fits very well, but I'm just going to share it. 
So my mom's Filipino, she was an immigrant. She came here with nothing. And she could have chosen to stay in the Philippines with her two her twin daughters, right? But um, she came on here with her husband who was waiting. And um, I thought a lot about the things that my mom had to sacrifice and all that she did. And so while school in some areas was pretty natural for me, there was this big push for my mama did so much for me, for me to get to where I am. And so when you think about racial uh, ethnic groups and think about black students in particular, and I've had a lot of black students across the universities where I've worked. And that was not the case for every black student, but I saw it more often than not, where I had to say, you know, what do you know about this? And sometimes it was that that thing, that job or the occupation was perceived as being um, very prestigious or the family really wants that person to have it, but they themselves were really sure about the fit. And so as an internship coordinator, what I did was I made them do interview papers. And I said, you need to find two individuals in your field um, and interview them. Now that doesn't, I don't think an advisor would do that, but I think the advisor should definitely be aware of the family context in which that youth is coming from. And then even that own, that student's own uh, like perceived value of that, that degree. And I don't know that you can tease that apart or break that down easily. Because if you're not a, you're not a black person or I'm just thinking about the same race, right? And someone says, you can't do this. If that person has a perception of people saying that as being racist, then they're, they're probably not gonna be able to hear it. I'm just speculating here, right? You're not gonna be able to hear what the advisor is saying. And so being able to establish rapport and to build relationship, I think is really important. I hate the idea, and there's a lot of research on this too with black faculty who have to do like in-kind hours for mentoring, but I do think it's important. So I'm not saying that white faculty or non-black faculty, and speaking of black students in particular, should dump black students onto someone else. But I do think that there might have to you know, need, to, need to be a strategic kind of method for at least combining. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if you would have co-advisors, but just some way of being able to maintain the advisor, but then also encourage mentoring from a person where they might be able to hear better. Does that answer your question or no? Okay. Yes, thank you. I have another question. Um, so uh, Guy would like to know, Guy Holly, one of our uh, YSS students would like to know, you mentioned that the one group, one group you're working with has already been doing similar work around purpose. How do you see your work as? Right, so they're not doing work on purpose. They're doing work on career, like career, career so job skills, workforce yeah, skills. Yeah, sorry. But, <laughs> but, I did not say that word. But they're focusing on workforce skills. Yes. Um, so right now, I don't know how they're doing it, but you know, when I met with them, it was really fantastic. They have a year long program that a lot of people stay in. I don't know, again, I don't know how it's possible, but they go through phases. And so they do need a program to try and keep people, some of those that might kind of fall out of the program, um, in the program because they focus on workforce readiness and like skills, like resumes and maybe interviews. You know, we don't necessarily focus on those things. We're actually focusing on something that's much more long term. Um, and I would say is really like mind framing. Like, how are you seeing this particular thing? How do you see yourself fitting in the world of careers and the work that you're doing? Uh, we want to equip parents. So while they do have parents who go to go through their program, also that was another thing. Um, this program has a parent engagement piece. I don't know the extent to which they cover parenting practices. I don't think they cover that at all. Um, but in terms of fueling or building off of what they're doing, I definitely see that there's a good synergy already. Um, and one of the things that I can say about this particular group is they're asking like, what do you need? Because they've already bought into kind of the vision of the program. And I see what they're doing. Again, it's not exactly the same, but it's very similar. So if anything, I see it as being complementary. What they're doing is not the same as what we're doing, but it is still important for teens to have like interview skills and, and they, they focus very heavily on financial literacy. That I do know, that program does, which we don't focus on heavily. We do offer resources or ancillary to the program, but it's not in our program content right now. Any questions here or in Right. Well, I think at that point we will 
wrap up and say thank you to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Alexander, for your presentation. And um, thank you all for joining us. We had a big participation online. There were so many people. So I'm uh, uh, <laughs> but I was going to say, shout out to Westbury and Dr. Yeah. The Camille. <laughs> They're working with me. <laughs> yeah. um, so thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you so much to you, Dr. Alexander, for uh, sharing your excellent work. I was. Um, it's just great. I mean, I, I don't think we hear enough about each other's work. And so thank you, Dr. Donaldson, for being the um, person to make sure that we're doing this fall seminar series. So our final seminar series will be um, next month with Dr. Harriet Edwards. So we invite you all to um, join us. And um, thank you again. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs>